We have to be brave enough to start to feel, to unmute from the feelings which are the very thing that define our humanity. Because when we do, we'll realize the fullness of our potential and the depth of our connection to each other, and we will radically change the world. When I was about eight years old, I had a PE teacher called Miss Golomberska. Polish Miss Golomberska was about six foot two in height and built like a female bodybuilder. She ran our PE sessions as though we were training for the army and was quite terrifying. Now, at 12, 13, many of us girls were adjusting to the onset of our periods, and they're signaling in many ways of the end of childhood and the onset of womanhood. And many of us had stomach cramps, terrible ones. But Miss Golomberska demanded that we all climb, sprint, or hockey our way through our pee sessions regardless. Now, what strikes me as significant about that is that it's likely that Miss Golomberska wasn't born a physical education tyrant. She was a product of her environment, conditioned to be resilient, trained to, to, to survive. And I believe it was these very survival traits that she trusted were crucial for us as girls growing up in a world which, let's face it, is far from always a playground. Was there merit to her approach? Absolutely. Is there much to be said for practicing resilience? Certainly. But the problem with my PE teacher's approach is that in forcing us to drive our still formative bodies, irrespective of their needs, she skipped over something. Something which has been skipped over well beyond the confines of the school gym for eons. She skipped over feelings. Now, I get that can sound fluffy. I'm the product of two working-class parents with a fierce work ethic. My mum hand-washed clothes over, over a bath with three kids under five. And as the daughter of a Windrush father who arrived in this country with a phone number and one suit, only to discover the mother country far less welcoming than radio broadcasts to Commonwealth countries might have suggested, I guess there's a part of me that still cringes a little as I stand here and share the message which, for me, feels the most important one that I could. As a people, we are disconnected from the very thing that binds us together. The impact, every crime against humanity, every policy and initiative that prizes money, power and dominion over collective good and purpose. From the war which obliterates a generation, to our individual capacity to walk down the street and avoid eye contact with a human being lying sleeping in the pavement bereft and cold. None of this would be possible were it not for the fact that we're disconnected from feeling. Because here's the thing. When we feel our feelings, we allow a doorway to connection to present itself. And as we experience that feeling of connectedness to ourselves, to each other and to the earth, it's impossible for that feeling of separation to exist. Connection means we cannot help but feel our shared humanity. And as we shift into that space of unity, suddenly we just make better choices. It's as though suddenly we see more clearly, like the facade of what we thought life was about, acquisition, winning purely for our personal gain, the need to be right, falls away to reveal the truth. That because we are one, we cannot prevail if our prosperity is at the cost of another. And in the sweetness of that knowing, we shift, we return to truth, we return to love. Often we think we get this stuff intellectually, this philosophy that we're all one and we're not separate. But it's a very different thing when this, human, when this mental understanding becomes something embodied, something we feel in the deepest levels, layers of our being as though it's woven into our cellular memory. Because it is. For me, that knowing occurred at a time in my life when I really didn't want to feel my feelings. My father, my person, was dying. Diagnosed with terminal cancer and just half a year to live, for the first half of that period, I ensconced myself in doing. I swapped the achievement, that I swapped the addiction to achieving professionally, which had come to define the woman I presented to the outside world, for full-on crisis management. I took on his schedule of radiotherapy appointments and x-rays like the most proficient PA, 
I explored alternative therapies and naturopaths and wrote written tributes in newspapers and mixed his Guinness punch with those nutrient-boosting drinks like a good Jamaican daughter. And at the time, much of that doing felt entirely necessary. But it also acted as a very clever way for me to dissociate from feeling the grief of the departure of this person I loved so much, who'd been the anchor in my life. As the weeks went on, my father's physical form began to reveal the truth that we couldn't continue to run from. He was slipping away, his body wasting before our eyes, and no amount of Guinness punch was going to keep him, at least in physical form, with us. And then on one unannounced day, which coincided with doctors saying that no more could be done and Dad should be allowed to return home to allow for his inevitable passing, the tsunami of grief which I'd suppressed for fear it might wash me away came hurtling to my surface in the car park of Hammersmith Hospital. And in that moment, when I'd never felt my feelings quite so viscerally and never been so alive in the rawness of that feeling, everything changed. For in feeling those oh-so-difficult-to-feel feelings, I also unlocked other parts of myself that had until that moment been numbed. And that unlocking gave me access to an expanded experience of myself and of my life. Suddenly, I was more in touch with what felt good for me, with what my needs are, and that new heightened awareness of those needs and what feels good has become reflected and honoured in the life that I live today. We run from pain, we run from grief, we run from sadness because we're terrified to feel. We paper over these feelings we've been taught are bad with all manner of distractions, food, alcohol, drugs, sex, work, some more socially acceptable than others, but all serving entirely the same purpose to shield us from the feelings which are most uncomfortable to confront. The mere mention of feelings in a business context is enough to spark alarm bells. Feelings are seen as unpredictable, chaotic, messy, <sighs> liable to distract from the agenda and company objectives. And yes, feeling, messy feelings can be, and the need for boundaries is a given. But the problem with any doing that takes us away from being with the feelings that are present for us is that it doesn't just paper over the painful stuff. It also inhibits our capacity to experience joy, bliss, awe, and perhaps most important of all, deep connection. And that lack of connection, in, that lack of connection dulls compassion, and it hampers empathy. And that lack of compassion and empathy leaks its way into surface-level corporate social responsibility initiatives and diversity and inclusion policies launched not from a deep, empathetic recognition of the need for an inclusive company and world, but because it's what they think they should be seen to be doing. The problem is, anything built on a should rather than authenticity is rarely sustainable. And besides, haven't we already tried that approach to changing the world? We're initiatived out, and yet some of our most so challenging social problems prevail. It's a disconnection from feeling that means 4.3 million children in this country are living in poverty. And it's a disconnection from feeling that means there are 280,000 people homeless in England and twice that number of uninhabited properties. And it's a disconnection from feeling that meant on June, in June 2017, 72 people lost their lives at Grenfell Tower. It's time for a renaissance in leadership. A brave new fleet of individuals able to lead from the inside out, so that heart and purpose are placed at the epicenter of everything that we do. And that restoration of compassion born of feeling walks its way into every courtroom, every boardroom, every classroom, every doctor's surgery, and every bus stop. And that reconnection to our humanity will revolutionize our existence. After that car park moment, I drove my father home for the last fortnight of his life. And as acceptance ushered in, with it, 
came the most profound grace. A grace only ever possible when acceptance is exchanged for resistance. With it, an experience of connection like nothing I've ever known. This is obviously a very personal experience, but the principle is universal, and we need not be faced with losing a loved one to grasp the gold. After all, isn't that the legacy of the pandemic? We're all hurtled globally into this space of needing to stop or at least slow down. And so today, we're faced with a choice. To return to our former way of being, irrespective of the fact that humanity is in crisis, global warming, mental health in dire straits, racism and police brutality ongoing, or we can forge a new way, an alternate path that sees us expand beyond this mechanistic way of being, which means we cease to see the humanity in the people that we share the earth with. I'm not advocating for losing the important role that rationale and logic play in helping us to formulate our decisions. I'm saying it's time that our heads were put to work in precedence, our heads were put to work in service of our hearts rather than in precedence of the deeper wisdom contained within our emotions. Can it be scary to feel the stuff that we'd rather not? Absolutely. But if we can unlock the courage to lean into all that we feel, if we can unlock the courage to lean into all that we feel, Finally, perhaps for the first time, we come face to face with just how beautiful we are as a people. And from that sacred space, where difference and separation are shown up as the fallacy that they really are, by feeling all of our feelings, one person at a time, from the inside out, we can radically change the world. <laughs>